All right, I've got a great show for you today. I have a whistleblower from the FBI. Uh, this has upended his life as he has come forward to tell the truth about what's going on within the Federal Bureau of Investigations. He's also a content creator now, like myself. And so I'm looking forward to this conversation. Kyle Serafin, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me on, Stephen. So um, the, the first question that I wanted to ask you is, as I read the news, um, I can't figure out why the Treasury Department and the FBI are so heavily focused on monitoring Donald Trump supporters. Is this really about the safety of the nation? Is this about getting a job promotion by getting somebody in jail? What, what, what is the fascination from the FBI and the Treasury Department on people that are interested in Donald Trump being president? I think the answer to that goes back a long ways. And so we kind of have to understand what the FBI is and what it isn't and why they would do that. I think Treasury is probably equally incentivized based on my experience with federal government. So we got to go back to 9-11, to unfortunately, to kind of really tell this story. Uh, and I think the easiest answer is this. After 9-11, September 12, 2011, I'm sorry, September 12, 2001, we had a, a federal agency that basically was given a mandate that changed and fundamentally altered the way that national security is looked at in this country. And so we've kind of grown up with that for a long time. Like I'm, I'm 42. So a lot of my childhood was one. And then we had this massive crossover. And the change was from here on out, no American will die from terrorism on American soil. And that was the fundamental shift. And that's a tyrannical mandate, it turns out. Because when you accept a zero fail mission, whether it be in the military or in law enforcement or intelligence, you've now given um, all the players that might otherwise be interested an opportunity to exploit. So what happened is the first thing they did is they went after Muslim terrorists and, and the potential for what we would call international terrorism, right? IT is the abbreviation. And those are people that are foreign ideology in a foreign place coming to the United States like 9-11, okay? Um, after that, they sort of ran out of that pretty quickly. Our U.S. military does a great job. We were tying them up overseas. They were doing lots of kinetic strikes and all the things that make terrorists have to focus on their own backyard, not ours. So we actually ran out of what we would call IT in that time frame. And so they started looking for the next move. What was the next move? This, we're going to get to why Donald Trump supporters were the final stop or the stop that we're at on this train. But uh, when they ran out of IT, they started doing a thing that people have heard the term, but they often don't know what it is. It's called uh, homegrown uh, violent extremist, HVE. And so people have heard the concept of an HVE. They don't know what it is. A homegrown violent extremist is someone that's in the United States. They're either a legal permanent resident, a green card holder, they're an, uh, you know, an overstay, but they have a reason to be in the United States that's authorized or at least started that way. But they affiliate with a foreign ideology. So they're looking overseas. They're saying, I live in Minneapolis, let's say, um, but I want to associate with Al-Qaeda or Al-Shabaab or ISIS or whatever. And so they sort of gain that foreign ideology and then they're going to try to perpetrate something here. And it turns out there's actually a fairly limited number of those people too. <laughs> you just, you don't have an unlimited number of people that live in the United States that are not persuaded that the United States is pretty good. And so we ran out of those as well. And that's when, because they were already looking domestically, the, the uh, intelligence agencies were able to kind of develop this thing of the domestic terrorists. Now it's always been there as, a, as a, like a green ideology or they had some issues with the militia movements back in the nineties and so on. There's some real problems with those as well. Um, but when you get into the sort of modern iteration of it, they kind of moved to this idea of domestic violent extremists or DVE, and then they just opened up the bag to going after, um, you know, militias. And then they started going after people that they are now calling anti-government, anti-authority violent extremists, aka Trump supporters. These are people that are looking at our federal government and the way that the world is looking right now and saying, this is not what our founding fathers thought about. You know, the anti-federalists were right. The federal government is overreaching. And that's an existential threat to people who work for the federal government. Like that's their job, right? So they're actually incentivized because that's where the money was following. The money was tracking from IT to HVE to DVE. And there's a bunch of financial incentives to the point where um, the FBI was so heavily focused on these Trump supporters, on people that are otherwise sort of, you know, they may have some ideologies that are that are unsavory, but they're still First Amendment protected. And we had the FBI step so far into that c category, they actually forgot to do the international terrorism mission uh, to the point where they almost lost $300 million in funding uh, last year. It was just an absolute failure to, to 
properly budget their resources because they're so obsessed with chasing the easy wins. And there are a lot of easy wins because that's what January 6th represents to the FBI. So hopefully that kind of makes some sense. It's it's kind of like the oldest reason, which is just basic you know, greed and uh, sort of the easy low-hanging fruit at this point. Yeah. This reminds me of like an episode of The Office where Oscar is trying to explain to Michael Scott, like, if you don't spend all the money, they think you need less. And so they shrink your budget. And he's like, but, so what do we do? And like, you go spend the money, you come up with reasons to spend the money and justify that big, that bigger budget. That's exactly what has been happening is, is like, they've run out of people uh, to go after. But this, this idea that everyone who's anti-government is evil. I mean, I'm a libertarian. I'm extremely anti-government. I want them out of every aspect of my life. I want them out of my money, out of my religion, out of my family. Uh, I understand, you know, the government is there and and there is good within the government, but I, you know, I'm, I'm very anti-government as far as, you know, the government doesn't do a lot of things well, bloated would, budgets and mistakes. And <laughs> I would say the government is the worst solution to any problem, even when they're the only solution to the problem. So sometimes we need to have government, but it's always going to be terrible because government is inefficient and it's you know mechanically designed to be terrible at what it does. A little great example of that office statement you were talking about, you know, go out and spend the money. My buddy Steve Friend, who I know has been on your program before, you know, he talked about basically trying to go and get new flash drives and recorders for investigating crime and transferring documents around. And they were like, oh no, we don't have any budget for that. But we do have forty thousand dollars. Why don't you go out and get a razor? like one of these off-road ATV type uh, devices. So they got that for the three times a year that they might have to go off-road to go find like a body or go to a crime scene. So we don't have $300 for everyday use items that are going to be used in the office, but we do have something in this other bucket, which is God knows what, you know, um, and, and it's for crime scene exploitation. And so we're going to spend $40,000 on a razor scooter that's basically going to just get housed in a garage almost every day of the year. That That's the federal government in a nutshell. Yeah, wow. And they wonder why people don't want to pay their taxes. It's not because uh, we're against taxation. I know that we need to be taxed. Otherwise, nobody's going to volunteer their paycheck to fix potholes in the road. But it's the way they abuse the money, right? Um, going back to what you said, running out of people, um, why why was the FBI suddenly so interested in pursuing uh, people of the Catholic faith? Was this really because... Uh, they worry about the Pope issuing Order 66 and they all go crazy and, and turn on their fellow citizens? Or was this really about opening a door to persecute Christians here in the United States? What, what are your thoughts on this Catholic thing? So the whistleblower that came to me was not Catholic and brought that document, which I've obviously made public and everybody kind of has heard about this. What's the FBI doing with Catholics? And the, the short answer is, I think it's a pry bar. I think it's a way to muscle your way into an otherwise protected First Amendment space that should be utterly off limits to an FBI or anybody else. But it also goes back to what we just talked about, the fact that they're looking for reasons to be able to investigate DVEs. One of the DVE categories is known as racially motivated violent extremists, which we would mostly know as white supremacists. It could be black supremacists, by the way. It's just not because they just don't investigate that very often or ever. So the idea that you need to have a certain number in each one of these categories they're looking for people that are going to fit it. And if you're ever, if you ever had a sump pump down in a basement, you know, if you have a wet basement, if you ever live in the Northeast, oh, yes. you have one of these things, right? So your sump pump is down there in the hole. And if water gets to the point where it's going to rise over the sump pump, then the sump pump is activated and it starts running. But when they break, what happens is, is that float fails. And so it just is always sucking and there's nothing there. And the air actually burns out the pump and it doesn't work. The FBI is like a sump pump with no off switch right now. It's constantly looking for things to fill up and they're not always there. So it's got to go find more water to put in. It's like having your kid go and just fill up the hole because you don't want the pump to burn out until it fills back up again. And the Catholic situation was this. They made the argument that radical traditionalist Catholics, which is a made up term, RTCs, but they coined it in this document. The idea is, is that people who like Latin mass, like the most austere of Catholics, are adjacent to white supremacists. And here's how we know it's a pry bar into not just Christians at large, which I think it is, but really conservatives mainstream. What they said was, is that their positions on an open border, which is that they don't like an open border, their positions on abortion, which is that they don't like abortion, <laughs> you know, that the, uh, the government shouldn't be involved in the LGBTQIA agenda, which is pretty mainstream for, you know, Catholics and all Christians, 
All of these things basically made them adjacent to white supremacists and susceptible to recruitment by these racially motivated violent extremists. And so when you make that argument, you've basically said, we're talking about this narrow thing. You know, the government always likes to try to say, we're just talking, we're not talking about you in your Christian faith. We're not talking about, you know, regular Catholics. We're talking about radical Catholics. And you go, oh, I'm not one of those. But the fact of the matter is, is if they could open that space, which should be First Amendment protected, they're going to have access to all of it. And so the possibility of using this pry bar to go after everybody, like I said, the person who brought it to me, not a Catholic, was concerned, said, when are they going to go after the radical traditionalist Baptists and the radical Lutherans and the radical Episcopals, whatever those look like, whatever these made up terms are, it's an ever expanding bullseye because we already know that they're looking for cases that don't exist. And that's a nonsensical thing to try to link to Latin mass Catholics. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, I guess learning uh, about church in Latin is the the crazy part. <laughs> no, sorry. Um, yeah. It, like, it, it's just so bizarre to me. Like I'm watching these congressional hearings and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, gosh, every Catholic I know is a pretty good person. I don't know why they're being like hunted down or, or there's targeted. Even, yeah. There's even a weirder thing like the FBI. And, and I went to Catholic schools growing up. I, I've been a Catholic my whole life, uh, you know, for better or for worse. I'm not always the best Catholic. I'm, I'm trying to be better now that I got kids. And the funniest thing for me is I would say that the FBI was the most Catholic organization I've ever been a member of outside of a specific church, like being part of a parish. It is full of Catholics. We've had Catholic directors. Louis Free is a Catholic. Um, so the idea that they, they, they decided to target people and Louis Free, from what I understood, like Latin mass. I mean, the people that are former agents have to be either rolling over in their graves or looking at their retirement checks and going, oh, my God, what have I served? Because it's just so perverted at this point. It's so bastardized from its original purpose. And that is so far afield. And we found out it wasn't just one person at one field office involved. There were multiple field offices that were involved. It was Portland. It was Los Angeles, possibly Milwaukee as well. So, you know, when Jim Jordan's office did the, you know, it's weird to write a news article and expose something about your former employer and then have that spawn congressional investigations. But that's sort of where I live right now. Like that's, that's yeah. what this is all about. It's just a strange yeah. existence. Oh yeah, I bet. I bet. Absolutely. Um, today, as we record this, uh, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, people from TikTok, um, Snapchat, other places, they are all being grilled by members of Congress for social media's role in exploiting children. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, they specifically called him out saying that he had blood on his hands for running a company that profits from exploiting children and knowingly leading young girls towards eating disorders. But they've got to keep that marketing revenue flowing, right? When you were at the FBI, did you ever uh, work on cases involving uh, exploiting children through social media? This was just something I was wanting to better understand. So specifically, that was not a task that I had, but because I worked on a surveillance team that did, um, you know, operational work on a bunch of different fields, I saw counterterrorism, I saw white collar, I saw violent crimes. We actually touched a number of these types of cases, not necessarily always social media. Usually it was through uh, like child pornography, what we call VCAC, violent crimes against children. And, and that spans the gamut of people that are exploiting from social media or they are specifically filming child pornography and distributing it and so on, or they're abusing kids. So there's a kind of a big range on that. I've seen some of it. And interestingly, I did have visibility because there was this weird situation called sexploitation. Are you familiar with this one? Yes. Uh, the FBI didn't want to touch it. They said sexploitation, not sexy to us, not going to get us a lot of statistics, not going to bring in more budget, not going to be. And then suddenly we had a couple of kids kill themselves over it. And that's obviously using either social media, which is where they're found. That's how they target these kids, uh, usually young boys that are in their teenage years. And they coerce or catfish or whatever you want to call it, them into sending sexually explicit photos, which, by the way, that's child pornography. That person's now guilty of uh, trafficking and child pornography. And then... You end up with uh, these, you know, demands for ransom and money and so on. And sometimes these kids basically have really, really awful situations. Uh, I actually had a personal friend that came to me with one of these cases. And I said, essentially, this is a, a numbers game for them. You know, they, they basically go at you until they can get money. And if they can't get money, they move on to the next guy. There's no upside into them, you know, exposing anything. So your, your risk is pretty minimal. There's not really any, you know, um, real exposure likely because if they do, the platforms are going to be guilty and so on. But the idea that this stuff is out there is really obvious. I think it's obvious to most people that worked in the FBI. And I think the saddest thing is, is that we could have every single, there's a roughly 14,000 FBI agents, a little bit less, 
If you had every single one of them working on child exploitation, child sex trafficking cases of all kinds, including social media, every single day, we'd never run out of work. You could literally ignore every other type of work there is, and there's an unlimited amount of work there. And instead, you know, they're doing things, the opportunity cost is that they're going to go after people in front of abortion clinics, and they're going to go after people that were at January 6th and so on, because that's where the that's where the funding is. And so it's interesting that Congress is talking about it. I think, sadly, you know, put your money where your mouth is, put some funding behind it, and take some funding from some other places. That would be the right move, is some allocation movements. And until we see that, I mean, these are all bread and circuses from my end of it. It's it's people talking about stuff with no real action happening. The rubber doesn't meet the road with this stuff. Yeah, how about uh, take take some of that out of Facebook and then clean it up on Facebook if they're not going to clean it up themselves? Really quickly, just so that parents understand this, um, because you may run into this. I've had to speak to my own teenage children about this. Basically, what happens is the, these predators, they start making friends with your children uh, through Snapchat or Instagram or, or something like that, uh, B-roll. And then they pretend to be, let's say, like a, a cute girl their same age, and they flirt with them while they're playing video games. And then a little while in, they send them a picture. And it's not them, but these boys' brains are like, oh, there's a cute girl, right? And then they're like, hey, why don't you send me a picture? And then they talk and they start asking questions that are starting to arouse the person. And then next thing they're like, hey, why don't you send me some pictures with your shirt off? Why don't you send me, you know, some, some racier photos? And they do. And then they tell them, we have these naked photos of you. Uh, give us a thousand dollars. And these, these children are killing themselves because they're so embarrassed and so ashamed. This isn't being, this grooming isn't happening over weeks or months. This is happening within hours. And so I just like, I just wanted parents to be aware of that so they can talk to their kids. And the other thing is that parents will see is, you know, are you missing money? Is somebody using your credit card to buy like a gift card? This is, you know, a Walmart gift card, an Amazon gift card. These are really good ways of, of doing money laundering on small scale, stuff like that, to be able to transfer these funds. And so, you know, that that's how parents get alerted. Oh, my credit card got used for a $500 or a thousand dollar Amazon gift card. Like what the hell is that? And when you start looking at it, you go, okay, you can, you can preempt this stuff by talking to your kids. And we used to know this, you know, we actually used to know this in America. The internet is not real, but more and more of our life is spent interacting with the internet. And so we don't have that natural skepticism. Like I get people that say horrible things about me on Twitter. I don't take it personally. I don't know who they are. They don't know who I am. They'd never say that to my face. I know that, but I'm a 42 year old man with children. So I have a grounding, but when you're a 14 or a 15 or a 16 year old boy, and it's, you know, hot girl pick saying these things, like you said, it goes right into the brain and they haven't immediately dismissed this as this is probably a con, which is exactly what it is. And the odds are it's some guy sitting in, you know, on the Ivory coast, that's sitting in a warehouse full of people doing the exact same thing, talking to 20 other guys, trying to get three of them to send them a thousand bucks, and then they make their quota for the hour or whatever that looks like. And so it's really ugly and it's very exploitive, but it's also very fast moving. As you said, the turnover is quick. The minute that you're no longer useful to them, it's, it's move on. And so once kids understand that, like, look, yeah, you did something stupid. You learned a great lesson. It might've even cost you 500 bucks. That's 500 bucks that it turns out might even be well spent for you to now have a lot of skepticism, which is something we're lacking. You have to be skeptical of people on the internet and information on the internet. You should go and, and uh, you know, confirm it for yourself. And if somebody says you this picture, you know, uh, sending pics across the internet doesn't mean the end of your life, nor should it. It doesn't even come close. Yeah. Okay. Going back to the social media, I've, I've been reading that uh, the cartels and uh, governments are, are using social media to put out advertisements that the United States is open, uh, President Biden will let you in. Uh, you, we've got this mass flood of migrants coming up through the border. Some of them have t-shirts that say, Biden, let us in. Like this whole thing is very systematic. Um, there, is, there are sirens going off, come to the border, come to the border. What is, what is your whole take on this Southern border crisis from uh, you know, Texas, do they have the authority to defend their own border? Uh, why does it seem that the Biden administration purposely wants the country flooded with illegal immigrants? What, what's your take on all of that? So I'm seeing the same things you are. And I spend a lot of time looking into that because that's near and dear to my heart. I live in Texas and it's one of those concerns that we have, like, you know, what's going on at our border. Um, it seems like the UN is funding a lot of that stuff. 
which means the United States is funding a lot of that stuff because we fund the UN. And so our money is going to basically fund what looks like an invasion at our southern border. Now, there's a couple of interesting things that, number one, the legal situation on the ground has not changed. The only thing that's really changed is the executive and their and the willingness to pursue immigration policy properly. We're seeing the Biden administration more and more interested. And I was always kind of wondering, what is the end game? Because you asked the, you know, what it looks like. And I didn't know until I just played a couple of clips today on my on my uh, podcast. And it sounds like it's the oldest game that they've been playing. It's called Cloward Piven, which is a, a strategy of essentially flooding the zone that is overwhelming the local resources. And then what is the solution? The solution is always more government. It's an unfalsifiable premise. It's like, well, we could have solved this, but we just needed more authority. All you got to do is give us more power, which you said libertarian. I lean the same way as far as like my general instincts. I want less and less government and the government I have, I want closer and closer to me, whether it be state or local. You know, I want the smaller the government to solve the problem. And interestingly enough, it sounds like the federal government is looking to grasp at more and more authorities, which they will abuse again. And then the answer is always more government. So this is a self-licking ice cream cone is what we call it in the federal service. It is the um, the unfalsifiable premise that you, if we just had more power, we could solve it. I think that's the end game. It appears to be the case. And we've basically seen 180 degrees if we saw the other side of the media kind of covering it. I think people on the middle and people on the left are not being fair about this. But the Biden administration claimed the border is secure. We've got it under control. We've got it all handled right up until the point where it's obviously not handled and 302,000 people snuck into this country that we're aware of, you know, just, just last month. That's a month. That's an incredible amount of people. We used to talk about a million a year, and now we're getting, you know, like a third of that in a month. That's crazy. And so add all of that together, plus the idea that he's coming forward and saying it, we just need more authorities. It leads me to closer to what that end game looks like. It still doesn't look like it works out really well. And, and my concern is that people on the political left that are looking at this and saying they're coming from a compassionate standpoint. And I don't hate people that are compassionate. Um, my wife is kind of like a recovering re compassionate person. It turns out that working for a nonprofit for years with a master's degree and having uh, you know four kids has basically disabused her of, of overwhelming compassion. You have to have some boundaries. You have to have some rules. Otherwise, it doesn't work. But uh, I, I think that that's just really first order level thinking. There's no second order level thinking. There's no third order of what are these effects going downstream. And it turns out to be, even in the compassionate argument, it falls flat because it's really, really bad for people that come here illegally when they don't have access to law enforcement. They don't have language skills. They don't have job skills. And that federal spigot at, at some point has to run out of money. And then what do you do? Like now they're in a worse situation than they've ever been. It actually isn't something that people on the left should be advocating on behalf of. So that it's maybe an education issue that we're, we're working on too. Yeah. Um, one area that um, I saw the, the government have less government uh, was on January 6th, when Nancy Pelosi turns down the 10,000 National Guard uh, Suddenly that day, the Capitol Police are understaffed, even though there's over a million human beings flooding into D.C. for the different rallies that weekend. Uh, it, it's almost like the opposite of this Piven thing that you were talking about, where it's like, wait a minute, we, we have enough people, but we don't know if we can get them to behave the way we want, which is to overrun the system, right? So let, let's actually, let's... Uh, let, let's stack the, the deck in our favor by having less police, less authority, less government, remove the barriers. They were putting up uh, bike uh, locking things instead of gates and fences. And then all of a sudden, okay, now let's really agitate them. Let's start throwing in the percussion grenades and the flashbang and stuff. What What's your take on that whole thing? Because I, I'm starting to see, you know, the story that the FBI had people, more people on the ground than any of us would guess. I've had other people say, no, uh, that's that's just a really great story. These people are the problem. What, what's your take on it all? I have a very nuanced perspective on this. Uh, so you, this may involve a little bit of background too. Um, for starters, I refer to January 6th and the events of those days as the American Rorschach test. And so if you're familiar with the Rorschach test, that's the ink blot, the classic, like put a blob of ink, fold it in half, and you're going to get something. And then what does that mean to you? And based on what you tell me you see, whether you see, you know, a duck that's shaking its head or two women kissing or whatever it is that it is, you know, there's a couple of different things it could be, whatever your mind interprets, that's the way that you're looking at some of the world. And if you think that it was the worst day in American history, it tells me a lot about you. And if you think that it was just patriots trying to patriotically raise their voice, that also tells me a lot. And I'm in the middle. 
I think that it was a bad day when it comes to the optics of it because it didn't move anything forward. Um, I lived in D.C. for or outside of D.C. for about five years. I, I lived in Fairfax County, which is just a feeder in northern Virginia to Washington, D.C., which is where I worked for the FBI for, like I said, about five years. I was an FBI agent in that field office on that day, and I was actually on leave. I was out in in uh, in Maryland doing a shooting course with a bunch of cops who ended up responding to the cap. And I've had uh, people from uh, NBC write hit pieces about me because I said we were laughing about it because we were laughing about it because it looked ridiculous. It looked ridiculous on the day of. If you remember looking at the media coverage, there was a, you know, the, the lectern guy was running off with the speaker's thing. And we're like, there's a guy sitting in Nancy Pelosi's chair. And you're like, what kind of clown fest is happening down at the Capitol? And how in the world did this happen? That was objectively funny to cops who have kind of a, you know, kind of a different sense of humor. But, but the fact that I was on leave that day tells us something very, very important. And so let me give the, the, the broadest spectrum. One of the first official things that I did when I was on duty was in January of 2017. I was at Trump's inauguration. And then I proceeded to be part of what are called national special security events multiple times a year for five years, for all the time, all the way up until January 6th. And I don't hear a lot of this being talked about in any media, let alone mainstream or otherwise. It's just not very well known that you can declare, and the Secret Service is the one that does it, it's DHS, but specifically Secret Service, declares an event in Washington, D.C. or other places as a national special security event, an NSSE, and it unlocks all these federal powers. There's actually federal law, and there's also some policy that says DHS is the primary agency, the Secret Service is the one that takes point, and they coordinate a response to a large event that is going to happen that's going to be of national significance. Example, every single year we have what's called the State of the Union Address. The president at a regular time is going to leave the White House and he's going to go over to Congress and be exposed, you know, whatever, and give the speech. And a lot of people protest and a lot of people show up and they celebrate. It's this big political event. Because of what that event is, it's an NSSE every year. There's also a Fourth of July parade. That's always an NSSE. Every inauguration every four years is an NSSE. These big events that happen where we know there's going to be 300,000, 500,000, a million people. The March for Life is a good one. Those are all NSSEs and they're regularly declared. And then by statute and by policy, DHS runs it, specifically Secret Service. Okay, that day was not declared an NSSE. When you have those days declared, everybody is on standby. There's two things that happen. Number one, all the federal resources come into play. Department of Energy brings out their teams and they sweep for dirty bombs and their, and their radiation detectors. You've got the FBI's dive team is out on a boat and they're running up and down the Potomac looking for bombs and making sure nobody's going to like bomb the bridges, okay, or like put something in the water. You've got the park police, which is another federal entity that has a helicopter. They're the only one allowed to fly and they fly over the national capital region. They look for problems and they cite it from their helicopter. So you're getting kind of the picture. There's a lot of resources. There's also local resources like the DC Metro PD, they get their entire riot squad squared away. And those people are all stood up. And then even if they don't deploy, they're paid overtime because the federal government's fitting the bill. So everybody loves the NSSE. They have anti-scale fencing. They've got contractors to provide it. We saw it for Biden's inauguration. If anybody remembers what oh, that looked yes. like. Yeah. Just a couple of weeks later, we suddenly had an entire lockdown. And I was working that as well. The entire DC area was locked down with, like you said, the right kind of fencing, anti-scale, six, eight foot tall. They're, yeah, I think they're eight feet tall and they sway so you can't climb them real easily. So interestingly, January 6th was set up to be a failure. It always looked like that Admiral Akbar kind of meme that you see. You know, it's a trap. That's what it felt like from the outside when I lived there. I was like, man, you don't want to go there. I talked to like active FBI agents who wanted to go down there and voice their protesting. You know, they wanted to be part in, of the of the rally and they wanted to, you know, have their First Amendment rights recognized. They wanted to take leave. I talked to a couple of guys out of it. It probably saved their career. There was no good reason to go down there only because it looked like a trap from the outside, from me. And the second thing is you talk about guys on the ground and all the kind of things that are going on. We just talked about how the FBI has this, this major incentive to find domestic terrorism. Every one of these incentives is not just at the agency level for the whole FBI. It's also at every single field office. And there are 56 field offices, which means you have 56 independent laboratories of senior executives that if they hit enough numbers whether it be total arrests or the DEI events that they have, which they do, um, and whether it be the right number of terrorism cases, whether they use surveillance the right number of times, they get Title III wiretaps or FISA, et cetera, et cetera. If they get enough of those things, they get a five-figure bonus, which most people don't know. They're called the Senior Executive Service. They get off the GS pay scale. So I was a GS-13 when I left. You're a GS-14. You're a first-line supervisor. A 15 
is the second line supervisor. And then usually the top guy or gal at a field office is an SES. And they make between 30 and $55,000 a year if they hit their bonus and their paycheck otherwise is like 175 or $180,000. So it's a big deal to get a 30 or a $50,000 bonus and they're incentivized to get those numbers. So every single one of those field offices was trying to get their domestic terrorism numbers. And they all had an independent reason for sending sources and undercovers into that crowd, which is why the FBI has such a hard time finding those numbers, because there's a ton of field offices. And some of those sources probably traveled on their own because now you've got all the sources and all the sources want to make money too. And the, the way that the FBI pays sources, which is going to possibly blow your mind if you haven't heard this, we pay sources in cash. Okay. It's okay. totally unaccountable and it's signed on by a name that's fake. So Stephen, if you are my source and, um, and I want to run you and I could, I could call you like white hoodie, that would be your name. And so you would sign it white hoodie received, let's say $5,000 for information about whatever it was or helping this prosecution. You know, there could be as much as six figures when it comes to the counterterrorism investigations, because people make couple hundred thousand dollars a year, not many of them, obviously, but the professional sources literally run around and live on the FBI in cash with no reportable income, which sounds kind of cool if you uh, are that kind of person. However, the, the concern the American people should have is that you have people that are receiving huge amounts of cash that are independently motivated to move these cases along. And oh, by the way, we saw what happened in Gretchen Whitmer. That was not an anomaly. That's the standard. So FBI counterterrorism cases, I would say by default, they're morally equivalent to entrapment, whether or not they legally meet that definition. And so that should probably scare people quite a bit. Yeah. Wow. Oh my gosh. That's, <laughs> Long uh, answer. Sorry about that. No, that that's that. Uh, everybody keeps trying to fit because I, I was grossed out by the day too. I was watching it. I was going, oh man, this is terrible. Why are these people doing this? Right. But I didn't know about like all of the things that were agitating people. I didn't know about people in the crowd. Um, I didn't know about the other side of the Capitol where like the doors opened and everyone was peaceful, but they walked in like there were so many things going on that the American people didn't know about the the some of the number one footage that CNN was using where they're attacking the police. They actually shaved off right before there where the police are beating somebody in the head with a baton and right. they're trying to stop them. But they edited that out. So all you see are people in Trump hats going crazy. And it's because they're trying to protect a woman on the ground being having her head beat in. So I, again, I'm, I'm with you where it's like, it was an ugly day, uh, but it smells, you know, oh, it's, it seem right. Yeah, it stinks. And here's another real big problem. And, and I don't see this being discussed a lot. You know, the Capitol Police, the U.S. Capitol Police, which is kind of the bottom of the barrel of federal law enforcement, if we're being real honest about it. They're not an elite organization. I'm not mad at them for doing the job, but they're glorified security guards that basically maintain physical security of the premise. It's like the FBI police who there's some really nice people that work in that, that role. But if you heard FBI police, you wouldn't know that that's basically an armed security guard that only has authorities to keep the FBI building safe. So they're not real police per se. It doesn't mean that they don't have a good mind or the capability, but that's just not what their role is. And so the role of the United States Capitol Police is securing the Capitol on any given day how much time do they spend doing riot work? How much time do the average officers get in what we call less than lethal munitions, which is throwing those concussion grenades or, you know, doing the paintball guns or they're pepper balling people or they're spraying with the, with the uh, OC spray? Because if you don't know how to do that, you're actually a liability. One of the nastiest things about concussion grenades and, and OC spray and even uh, CS gas, which is the tear, the tear gas, those are area denial tools, right? What you do is you put them in a place where you don't want people to be. And if you were really effectively trying to run people off the barricades, you wouldn't throw it behind people's heads so they have nowhere to go except into the barricades. You'd throw it right in front of the barricades. Your people are all masked up and then everybody has to walk backwards. If you ever see the great iconic sort of riot look, it's riot shields coming through smoke, right? It's because yeah. they drop the OC or they drop the, uh, the CS gas in that case right in front of them and they fume out the area, and then they come and they drive and they create more space. Then they drop down another canister and that goes and blows people backwards. So OC, and and you know that's directed, that's your spray, um, that's your pepper spray, but your CS gas, it's area denial. And if you don't give anywhere, you know, people areas to go, if you've ever been in CS gas, which I have, and it's awful, it's really bad for me. I, I'm, I'm really weak when it comes to that stuff. You know, my nose runs, my eyes water, I feel like I'm gonna puke. You know, like all my mucilaginous membranes react really, really aggressively. So you can't see where you're going. You're choking, which is the other piece of it. You can't breathe it in. And so you're just 
you're, you're going to be desperate. You're going to be hypoxic. You're going to make terrible decisions. The only decision you should make is to get away from it. And if that's over a barricade, you're going to do that. I promise you, because it's awful. And if you have it in front of you and you're like, oh, this barricade is what my, one of my buddies in uh, Portland, we touched a railing that it had some, uh, some CS gas on it. And it's, and it, and it lails with like a like, white powder on top. You can like feel it. You go like, oh, and he looks at it and he goes, what do you think? I go, I think that railing is pretty spicy. And he was like, yeah, man, that's spicy. You don't want to touch that. Uh, even wet skin will activate it. And so when you know that you're going to go away, you know, most average people are not going to push through a cloud of that. But if you throw it right in the middle, people are going to scatter in all directions. And some of those are going to go in the directions towards you. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Wow. Well, this has been, a, this has been really insightful, Kyle. Um, if people want to continue to follow you, where, where can I push them to, to stay in touch with you? Yeah, the two best places, uh, rumble.com slash Kyle Serafin, which is just my name. That's the easiest thing to do. That's the morning podcast, which we do. Uh, we run it live. So it's going to be current events and, and commentary from hopefully an educated position. And then uh, also I engage and mix it up on Twitter all the time. It's my favorite. Uh, I don't know why I think Twitter is so fun. It's a cesspool, but it's like a it's like mud <laughs> wrestling with everybody. And so I'm at Kyle Serafin pretty much everywhere. It's just at Kyle Serafin if you go look for me. Okay. I'm going to put those down below so that people can uh, check it out. Thank you so much for coming on. The The insight uh, was really incredible. I, the, I mean, I learned a lot about the FBI and the, the J6 and the incentives that, you know, even after uh, almost two years of researching, it was eye-opening to me. I, I think it will be for my audience as well. So thank you so much for coming on. And I, I hope you have a great rest of your day. You too. Thanks, Stephen. I appreciate it.